with the finishing touches on a perfect season, 11-0, 59-11. Could not be any happier for that man right there who has seen and done it all. And he's at the top now, and it's well-deserved. And I think the thing that makes it that much nicer, again, it was a long, long, long climb to the top. He inherited the program, but was at the depths of despair and has changed the, the fortunes of this team through hard work, honest effort, and you can commend Bill McCartney and his staff for what has turned out to be a, a fairy tale like season. On November 18th, 1989, the Colorado Buffaloes finished a perfect regular season, 11-0 for the first time in school history, by polishing off Kansas State 59-11. It was a triumphant moment for a coach who had taken a program from the cellar to the pinnacle of the sport. Before Bill McCartney took over at Colorado, the Buffs had gone a mere 7-26 and under previous head coach Chuck Fairbanks. It was a great turnaround that culminated in a national championship the very next season. A great rebuild, no doubt. But that's not who this story is about. It's about the team on the other sideline, the team who hosted the Buffaloes that day, who only had a few thousand people show up to this game, most of whom were not their own fans. One can imagine that the K-State fans who were present were thinking that this new coach, this Bill Snyder, was just the latest coach on the K-State chopping block. After all, this embarrassing loss brought Snyder's inaugural season to a close with a 1-10 record, a pretty normal season by KSU standards. Unlike Colorado before its rebuild, Kansas State had never been good. For a head coach, Kansas State was a career killer. No coach had finished his time at Kansas State with an overall winning record since 1934. No coach who had ever been fired by Kansas State had ever gone on to be a head coach again. If you want to see a team that was really in the depths of despair, this was it. But less than a decade later, this same program would be contending for national championships. So how did they get from here to here? This is the story of the greatest turnaround in college football history. What's the worst team in college football right now? You might say New Mexico. UMass gives them a run for their money. Maybe some random Mac school like Akron. But in 1989, it was obvious. Kansas State. Indisputably, undeniably the worst program in college football. No matter who you think the worst program is today, 1989 Kansas State blows them out of the water. How bad were they? Coming into the 89 season, the Wildcats were fresh off consecutive winless seasons and working on a winless streak that would eventually reach 30 games. Their all-time record was 297 wins, 510 losses, and 41 ties for a winning percentage of 370. The Wildcats had been to a grand total of one bowl game, the Independence Bowl in 1982, which they lost. They had one 10-win season in program history, which came in 1910, and only one conference title in 1934 under Hall of Famer Pappy Waldorf, who spent one season in Manhattan. From 1955 to 1989, they had had two winning seasons. In fact, the Wildcats had never even finished a season ranked in the AP poll. So that's it. That's all their accomplishments. In nearly 100 years of football, they had compiled one conference championship, one 10-win season, one bowl appearance, and more losses than any team in Division I. By 1989, Kansas State was the Big 8 Conference's whipping boy. If a team needed to get right after a tough loss, there was no better way than to have Kansas State up next on your schedule. From 1975 to 1988, K-State averaged one conference win per year. So the K-State fan in the stands at the end of 89 could be forgiven for thinking that this season had been just more of the same. But the reality was that it wasn't the same. Things were going on behind the scenes that would change the Wildcats football program forever. In 1988, Kansas State had hired Steve Miller as their new athletic director. The football program was his top priority. Fortunately for him, he didn't have to fire anybody as head coach Stan Parrish resigned before the halfway point of the 1988 season. While he stayed on to finish the season, that still meant that the head coaching search was on. But no coach with two brain cells would take the job as it currently was. Things were going to have to change. Miller reached out to Iowa offensive coordinator Bill Snyder, who consistently produced quality offenses, including a Heisman runner-up in 1985, quarterback Chuck Long. 
Snyder had just as many questions for Miller as Miller had for him. Snyder wanted to make sure that real substantive changes would be made. But when all was said and done, Snyder became the 30th head football coach at Kansas State University. The program Snyder inherited literally couldn't have been worse. In terms of recruiting, tradition, TV exposure, game atmosphere, facilities, it was all abysmal. The bleak outlook prompted Sports Illustrated to call Kansas State Futility U. Nevertheless, Snyder took the job believing he could change the program. To change a program, you have to change the culture. But how was he going to do that? There was no tradition to fall back on. Losing was baked into the program at a foundational level. Former linebacker Will Coakley said, The problem is, every time we think we are good, we remember we are Kansas State. Winning was simply unknown to the Wildcats. And Manhattan was a hard town to recruit to at the time. Kansas high school players usually spent their time thinking about playing anywhere but the state of Kansas. In 1989, players wanted to go to bowl games. They wanted to be on TV. That meant going to Oklahoma or Nebraska or leaving the Big 8 altogether. And who do you recruit in the first place? Kansas didn't produce too many players to begin with. Additionally, major programs in neighboring states like Nebraska, Colorado, and Oklahoma kept their states on lockdown. Attendance was the worst in the Big 8 at 18,000 fans per game. Those were the official numbers anyway. It was an inflated figure to be sure. The Wildcats were lucky if there were actually 5,000 present at any given game. With such low attendance, Kansas State was in danger of dropping out of Division 1A. With all these disadvantages, where do you start? Steve Miller started by increasing the football program's budget. He had the press box replaced, the field upgraded, and the football offices and workout facility remodeled. Additionally, coaches would get more money in the recruiting budget. For his part, Snyder started by hiring coaches he knew were winners. He raided Hayden Fry's Iowa staff for coaches like Del Miller and Bob Stoops. Once he had coaches who bought in, he had to get the players to buy in. Several were planning on transferring or quitting football altogether. One was walk-on freshman receiver Michael Smith. The reality was that this walk-on may have been the most talented offensive player they had, and when Snyder promised him a scholarship, Smith agreed to stay. Snyder also ramped up off-season workouts to a level of difficulty none of the players on the roster had ever experienced. In fact, it drove off dozens of players, ensuring that those who were left were guys that really wanted to be there, but it also ensured a very thin roster for 1989. How did K-State recruit? On nothing but a dream. With no tradition, all Snyder could promise was possibility. And K-State wouldn't be able to get blue chip guys, so they went for junkyard dogs. Guys that were scrappy, guys that were tough, guys that punched above their weight. Guys like Reggie Blackwell. While extremely talented, Blackwell had been born with only one eye, so all major programs passed on him, but not Snyder. Guys like Blackwell would become the foundation for Snyder's early Wildcat teams. Snyder also had the school design a new logo in an attempt to distance the team from its past. That first season, all of these changes didn't seem to help much as the Wildcats went 1-10 with the season-ending loss to Colorado. On the bright side, they won a game, breaking that 30-game winless streak. On September 30th, the Wildcats held a 14-10 lead late in the fourth quarter against North Texas. North Texas's last hope was to convert a fourth and long with just over a minute left. And they did. Kansas State had lost many games like this over the years, but this Snyder team was different. Instead of rolling over, the Wildcats went to work. Quarterback Carl Straw completed several passes to Michael Smith to put KSU in striking distance with enough time left for one play. Straw hit Frank Hernandez on an out route, giving K-State their first win since 1986. Most teams' fans rush the field after a big win, but in the Little Apple, you rush the field after any win. Cleveland fans know the feeling. And while that was the only game they'd win that season, the foundation of hard work and toughness had been laid. In 1990, Wildcats fans were treated to a stunning development as Kansas State won three of their four non-conference games. Before non-conference play even started, K-State had matched their win total from the last four seasons combined. Having a winning record was unfamiliar territory for the Wildcats. However, they only won two conference games and finished the season 5-6. and six. But two conference wins in a season? That was almost unheard of in Manhattan. 
In spite of still finishing with a losing record, you could sense the hope in the air. Very few spoke it out loud, but those who were paying attention started to entertain the thought. This could work.